The theme of pluralism, uh, that really is a big theme. I've lived all my adult life as a Christian, a lifelong Methodist, wrestling with these issues of how we think about our deepest human differences. What kind of questions do they raise for our faith? And I do believe this is one of the most important issues for the world in our time. I grew up in a mountain valley in Montana, an absolutely beautiful place, uh, the Gallatin Valley, where religious diversity was not a salient fact of life. There were Methodists, Presbyterians, Catholics, and uh, some evangelical independent churches. But, uh, and there were native peoples to be sure. In fact, my very first job was on uh, the Northern Cheyenne Reservation, uh, working for the State Department of Health in Lame Deer. There were no Jewish communities that I knew then in Bozeman, but I did get very involved with my church. I was involved with the Methodist Youth Fellowship, both on the state and on the national level. And we were engaged in some of the big issues of the day. We did work camps, I suppose, what uh, they now call uh, habitat projects in Mexico on the Blackfoot Reservation. We uh, went, I went with the National uh, Methodist Youth Fellowship and Methodist Student Movement to um, a conference in Ohio in 1963 and we drove all night from that conference and arrived in the early morning of uh, August day in 1963 to Washington for the March on Washington. So it was with Christian students that I went to that march and heard those words of Dr. Martin Luther King on that steamy August day and with my Christian student group that I went to Washington DC on spring break in my freshman year and lobbied for the civil rights bill. Those were heady days and we spoke of race relations. We didn't really talk of interfaith in those days. I have to confess that I had never met anyone who was Jewish until I went to college. In 1965, as a junior in college, I went even further east from my home in Montana and spent that junior year in India. It was a year abroad program, it was in Asia, and that was the thing that mattered most. We were deeply, deeply involved in the Vietnam War in those days. Our friends, our classmates were being drafted, were being killed. Our involvement of our lives was uh, part of the ruin of Vietnam and Cambodia. And all of our involvement far outstripped our knowledge of those parts of the world in ways that reminded me very much today of our involvement as Americans in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in parts of the world in which our cultural and religious knowledge as Americans is so shallow compared to our involvement as a nation. And I felt I needed to know more about the traditions of Asia. That's why I went to India. It wasn't Vietnam, but it was close enough. And it was there in India that I really found my life's calling, what I would consider God's calling to my life, my vocation. I might have gone into Christian ministry, but my sense of calling was something different. It was the challenge of studying and trying to understand the religious worlds of Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs that were religious worlds I did not share entirely at all, really, that were strange to me as I lived that first year in the city of Benares on the banks of the Ganges, one of the holiest cities in India. But religious worlds that I was challenged to understand. And my attention was then, especially on the Hindus, so many gods, so many understandings of God, singular, multiple, how was I to understand it? How did they understand it? What were their many understandings? But it was also in that sacred city of the Hindus that I first heard the call to prayer. And it was in India that I first went to a synagogue in uh, Cochin, in the, city of, in the state of Kerala. Well, since then, there have been many, many uh, years spent in India, um, many Hindu temples. I work on sacred geography and pilgrimage uh, from the Himalayas to the southern seas. And uh, as I said, I probably spent more time in Hindu temples than any other living Methodist. And since then, dialogue has really become a very deeply important and natural part of my life not a dialogue set apart around an artificial table somewhere, but the dialogue that accompanies day-to-day -day life lived in a multi-religious environment, which is almost everywhere these days. 
Um, I continued my work in India, to be sure. I also began working in the United States when it became clear that so many people of Indian origin came as immigrants to the United States after the 1965 Immigration Act opened the doors to immigration in the US for the first time ever, really, to immigrants from Asia. And I also became involved as a participant in some of the dialogue movements of the World Council of Churches, of the National Council of Churches, of the World Conference on Religion and Peace. And as I took up my work at Harvard, I have colleagues who are Hindu, who are Muslim, like my colleague right next door in the Barker Center, uh, Ali Asani, who are Jewish, who are humanist. Um, I have foster children who are Kosovar Muslims. Dialogue is not something set apart, but is the way in which we engage with the people who are our neighbors, uh, either neighbors across the street, across the hall, in our own dorm rooms, or around the world. And it's not all happy hand-holding, although there is some happiness involved in it, but a difficult dialogue to communicate across some of the great chasms that separate us as human beings. And there also is that dialogue within, within our own tradition. Uh, those are some of the most difficult dialogues, in a way, because all Christians don't think the same thing about these issues, as you may well know, and the same with Muslims, and the same with Jews. My teacher, as a student here at Harvard, and a young professor as well, was Wilfred Cantwell Smith, and it was 50 years ago when he, in 1961, gave his inaugural uh, convocation address in the Memorial Church uh, for Harvard Divinity School, in which he said, and it's germane to our understanding of pluralism, that any serious intellectual statement of the Christian faith today must include some sort of doctrine of other religious ways. He challenged the Divinity School faculty, and that was 50 years ago, and I'm still not so sure how they've come up to that challenge, calling for a new theological thinking that would take seriously the voices and visions of equally rigorous thinkers who are Muslim or Hindu or Jewish. From now on, he said, the articulation of our faith as Christians must take into account the world of religious vibrancy and intellectual depth that the study of the world's religions reveals. I don't know how we'll contend with these questions, he said, but I do know that from now on, these are the questions with which we must contend. These are the questions that are at the heart of Veritas, uh, engagement with our own religious tradition, and engagement with the religious ideas and faith of others. And this is a challenge of people in every tradition. Does the study and engagement with another destabilize our own faith? Does it threaten our own? Does it relativize our own, enrich our own, etc.? And of course, in these 50 years, the world has changed so much in the 50 years since Wilfred Cantwell Smith's inaugural address here. It changed with two major uh, engines of change. The first, of course, the massive migration of peoples from one part of the world to another, including the migration of so many peoples to the United States. The religious landscape of the United States is totally unlike what it was 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30, even 20 years ago. Um, and this is true of countries in Europe as well where Tamil Hindus have temples and religious communities in Bern and Strasbourg, and Gujaratis, like the Global Swami Narayan movement, have landmark temples in London and Houston, and Sikhs litigate for the right to wear their turbans in Canada and carry the kirpan, or Christians and Jews and ardent secularists in our society encounter new religious neighbors, sometimes with a kind of wary uncertainty. And the other twin engine of this vibrant and ras rapid fast-moving change is, of course, the communications revolution. That even if you don't venture around the world or even across the street, um, the religious teachings and scriptures and, and words and, and ideas of people of other faiths are very much part of the discourse of the world. And uh, it's on the news, it's on the internet, and Vatican Television has launched its own YouTube channel powered by Google Italia that makes clips of all of Pope Benedict XVI's speeches, et cetera. Sheikh Qadadawi in, Do in Doha has a popular show on Al Jazeera and issues fatwas in response to questions submitted from around the world. So in our time, this deep and widespread encounter with religious diversity 
is more pervasive than ever before. And if I ask, how is this related to pluralism? Well, we've already said a little bit. I mean, I, I have a pluralism project. I gave the Gifford Lectures in Edinburgh on what I call the age of pluralism. And to me, if we look at pluralism, I need to say a few things about it. One, that it is a topic of study, that to study the complexity of our world today uh, places those who are religious scholars of religion, want to know something about the energies of religion in a completely different challenging place. You cannot study a single religious tradition as if it grew up all by itself. No religious tradition has, and especially today. They are engaged with one another in complex societies. And so the challenges for us as scholars of studying pluralism are significant. There are also challenges for us as citizens because we share our cities and towns and our countries increasingly with co-citizens of other faiths. And the challenge of multi-religious democracy is certainly ours in the United States. It's part of the challenge of every single nation of Europe, of India, Indonesia, Malaysia, and even for deeply secular people who have absolutely no personal use for religion. This is a situation that demands a response of how to live in a multi-religious society in which our citizens, our fellow citizens, um, are, are as different from one another as they are today. And these problems and the challenges of creativity they pose for all of us as citizens are not just theoretical. They're grounded in our everyday context in cities and neighborhoods. These are the workshops in which our future is being built. And the third context, of course, is that the age of pluralism is not just about how we study this diversity or how we appropriate it as citizens, but how we appropriate it as people of faith. Because people in every single faith tradition are faced with this same question that brings you here tonight. How do we interpret the diversity of human religious experience? How do we understand it um, as Christians or as Muslims? And one thing is very clear that uh, pluralism is not just this diversity. Pluralism is engagement with this diversity. It is uh, not just tolerance, because tolerance is far too thin a foundation for a world in which we live as closely with one another as we do. Um, we need to know more about each other and not simply tolerate each other. And pluralism is not relativism. Pluralism does not mean we all agree on this thing or that thing. The paradigm of pluralism does not require us to leave our identities and commitments behind because pluralism is the encounter of commitments. And it means holding our deepest differences, even our religious differences, not in isolation, but in relation to one another. And the language of pluralism, finally, is the language of dialogue. And it is a language as we enter into the world in which we live today and will live for the rest of our lives. It is this language of dialogue that we need to learn, a language of uh, hearing and listening, of witnessing and hearing the other. And uh, this is the language, so to speak, the discourse of the future. Now, let me say a word in conclusion about how deeply important this is for communities of faith. Um, and for every community. If Rabbi Jonathan Sachs were with us tonight, the chief rabbi of England, he might draw on the resources of the Exodus and the lessons of being strangers in an alien land. How do we regard as Jews the strangers within our gates? In his book, The Dignity of Difference, he writes, can we recognize God's image in one who is not in my image? Can we recognize God in the face of a stranger in this global age which has turned us all into society of strangers? Can I, as a Jew, hear the echoes of God's voice in that of a Hindu or Sikh or Christian? Can I do so and not feel diminished but enlarged? Or a Muslim like Tariq Ramadan might turn to the doctrine of Tawheed, the oneness of God. How does the Quran's revelation of God's oneness shape a Muslim understanding of human religious diversity? And as a Christian, I have to say I'm astonished at how many Christians seem to think that the only resource Christians have for thinking about their relations with people of other faiths is a verse from John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life, etc. Um, in our relations with people of other faiths, 
I as a Christian might turn to the Gospels anew and decide that this good news is not in the first instance about ideas or dogma. It's about relationships. Relationships that transcend the boundaries of tradition, ethnicity, and social standing. It's even about transgressing those boundaries and restrictions and legalistic constructs of one's own tradition, even as Jesus did, to reach out not only to neighbors, but to strangers and outsiders. And in my book, Encountering God, I explore how my own encounters with those of other faiths have shaped and deepened my own faith as a Christian. And finally, let me turn to some of the ways in which, theologically, we need to think together. And I mentioned the World Council of Churches because I actually believe um, that whoever the group is you think with, that Christians don't think all by themselves. We think together with others. And this has been an important topic of work in the Christians of the World Council of Churches. Thinkers from Britain and Germany, Ghana, South Africa, Lebanon, thinking together as theologians about the changes of our time that they say require us to be more attentive than before to our relationship with other religious communities, challenge us to acknowledge others in their differences, to welcome strangers even if their strangeness sometimes threatens us, and to seek reconciliation even with those who have declared themselves our enemies. In other words, we say, we're challenged to develop a spiritual climate and theological approach that contributes to creative and positive relations among the religious traditions of the world. And this is serious business. Now let me highlight just a few words that are words that have been highlighted here. One, mystery. The mystery of God's relationship to all people and the many ways in which people have responded to God's mystery invite us to explore more fully the reality of other religious traditions and our own identity as Christians. Two, creation. What does this truly imply, the starting point of creation? The conviction that God as creator of all is present and active in the plurality of religions makes it inconceivable to us that God's saving activity could be confined to any one continent, cultural type, or group of people. Three, the hospitality of Christ. Christ's hospitality is not limited to those in our own community, but extends to the stranger and the outsider, involves us in the kind of self-emptying and receiving others in unconditional love, even for our enemies. As Christians, therefore, we need to search for the right balance between our own identity in Christ and our openness to others in canonic love that comes from that identity. And finally, the renewal of the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit that the Gospel of John tells us blows where it wills. We discern the Spirit of God, these theologians said, moving in ways we cannot predict. We see the nurturing power of the Holy Spirit working within inspiring human beings in their universal longing for and seeking after truth or peace and justice. We believe that this encompassing work of the Holy Spirit is also present in the life and traditions of people of living faiths. Our ability to think in new ways challenges us in this age of pluralism, and it challenges us as scholars in a university committed to Veritas, as citizens in multi-religious nations, and as people of faith, as we think deeply from the resources of our own faith about our encounter with the religious other. Thank you.